what he did in this experiment was he took a gas in very low pressure inside your discharge tube and he applied high voltage so what happens now when there is no electric and magnetic field is applied we know that your cathode ray will move in a straight line yes and it reached the point b as they are moving from anode to the cathode right they are positively charged particles and they are deflected by electric and magnetic field similar to that of a positively charged particle hello everyone this is ambali unnikrishnan from the department of chemistry vidyashram pre university college the temple of excellence mysore so today we are beginning with the unit 2 of your syllabus that is structure of atom right so in today's class we will be discussing on the introduction of it yes and we will be studying about the discovery of subatomic particles we'll be studying in detail about the discovery of proton discovery of electron and discovery of neutron in this session right so yes now as the chapter name suggests structure of atom yes you will be going to study in detail about atom yes we know that matter is made up of atoms right and atoms in the beginning were considered to be indivisible right and then in current scenario we know that atoms are divisible right inside atoms electrons protons and neutrons are present yes so in this chapter we will be basically studying about the discovery of the subatomic particles what was the history behind it which are the scientists or who are the scientists who discovered um, these subatomic particles and how the discovery was made the experiments and then we will be studying about various atomic models as well so as an introduction let's see the existence of atoms were proposed since the time of early indian and greek philosophers so since 400 bc the philosophers were having an idea about atoms right yes matter is constituted of tiny particles which is called as atoms but according to them atom was not divisible right according to them continued division of matter would ultimately yield atoms yes but which could not be further divisible but we know that now atoms are divisible right yes the word atom has been derived from the greek word atomio which means uncuttable or non divisible right then afterwards dalton's atomic theory was proposed so according to dalton's atomic theory also atoms were considered to be indivisible right so later it was discovered that atoms are divisible into protons electrons and neutrons right so the atomic theory made by dalton that is dalton's atomic theory was able to explain the law of conservation of mass law of definite proportion law of multiple proportion but it it couldn't explain various other experiments that were conducted later hence dalton's atomic theory had its own limitations which led to the discovery of our subatomic particles right so the major problems for the scientists at that time were when they were trying to discover the subatomic particles present inside the atom yes subatomic particles that is atom the particles which is present inside the atom they faced these problems to account the stability of atom after the discovery of subatomic particles to compare the behavior of one element from other in terms of both physical and chemical properties to explain the formation of different kinds of molecules by the combination of different atoms and also to understand the origin and nature of the characteristics of electromagnetic radiation absorbed or emitted by atoms so these were the few problems which were faced by the scientists during the time they were trying to discover the subatomic particles so now we are beginning with the discovery of our subatomic particles so a beginning to the discovery of subatomic particles was made by michael faraday in the year 1830 okay so the history starts from here yes in 1830 michael faraday showed that if electricity is passed through a solution of an electrolyte yes chemical reactions occurred at the electrodes which resulted in the liberation and deposition of matter at the electrode so michael faraday using his experiments was able to prove that if we pass electricity through an electrolyte electrolyte is let's take an example of sodium chloride yes you know that it is constituted of na plus and cl minus ions right 
yes so electrolytes when electricity is passed through electrolytes yes chemical reactions takes place yes so he was able to conclude this from his experiment so how did he do his experiment he took this setup which is called as cathode ray tube or you can also call it as cathode ray discharge tube yes so what is this cathode ray discharge tube a cathode ray tube is made of a glass containing two thin pieces of metal called electrodes sealed in it yes so you can see that there are two thin metals that is present here one will be your cathode and one will be your anode yes and then the pressure of different gases could be adjusted by evacuation yes inside this part you will have your gas present and the pressure of the gases can be maintained through the evacuation which is present right so the gases present inside your discharge tube will be present in very low pressure right so what he was able to conclude that when sufficiently high voltage when high voltage of electricity is applied across the electrode the current starts flowing through a stream of particles from cathode to anode so what he did in his experiment was he took a gas in very low pressure inside your discharge tube and he applied high voltage so what happens yes particles started moving from there were some particles inside the gas which started moving from cathode towards your anode okay yes so this was the beginning of the discovery of your subatomic particles so the first one we are going to deal with here is discovery of our electron yes so the scientist who discovered electron is j j thompson yes you have to remember the name right so let's move on to the experiment that he did so that he discovered the electron right so he also took this uh, cathode ray discharge tube yes so what did we understand from michael faraday's experiment yes when we take a discharge tube inside which a gas is present in very low pressure and a high voltage is applied what happens yes some particle starts moving from the cathode to anode yes so when current starts flowing through the tube a stream of particles were observed moving from cathode to anode so this was observed by r j j thompson yes so as it is moving as these particles were uh, moving from cathode to anode they were named as cathode rays right yes this was further checked by using perforated anode and coating tube behind anode with fluorescent material zinc so Uh, he concluded that there is some particles which is moving from cathode to anode which is called as cathode rays but this was not uh, you were not able to see it with your eyes so to prove it or to confirm that actually some particles is moving from cathode to anode what he did is he took a perforated anode yes what is perforated means holes will be present in the anode you can see there are gaps in here right so he took perforated anode so that what happens now the particles which starts moving from cathode they'll move and they'll pass through these gaps right and what he did is behind the anode he coated the screen with a zinc sulfide he coated behind the anode with zinc sulfide it is a fluorescent material so what happens is when the particle starts moving from here it passes through the gap and when it touches here that is the zinc sulfide coating it shows color yes you can see a yellow color will be formed here right in the diagram you can see that so from this he was able to prove that actually there are some particles which are moving from cathode to your anode right so now we are going to see what all are the characteristics of the cathode rays that he discovered right so results of your cathode ray experiment so first one is cathode rays starts from the cathode and move towards the anode yes we saw that now it starts from the cathode and moves towards the anode that is why they are called as cathode rays and they are negatively charged particles yes how he was able to prove that it is negatively charged particles let us see the behavior of these rays can be observed by using fluorescent material which glow when hit by them yes we saw it in here yes this was the zinc sulfide coating that was introduced there so that once your particles go and hit there it will start glowing so he was able to prove that yes there are some particles which is moving right in the absence of electric and magnetic field these rays travel in straight line if there is no electric and magnetic field present yes they will uh, travel in straight line now 
what happens when i introduce electric and magnetic field it shows deviation in the presence of electric and magnetic field similar to that of a negatively charged particle right how a negatively charged particle will behave in the presence of electric and magnetic field in the same way the particles present in cathode rays were behaving so he was able to conclude that the particles that are present in cathode rays are negatively charged and he named it as electrons right yes now the cathode rays this is very important now the cathode rays do not depend on the nature of the gas and material of the electrodes so whichever gas you take inside your uh, discharge tube or whichever metal you consider as your cathode and anode it doesn't create a problem for your cathode rays so the cathode rays the behavior of the cathode rays will not depend upon your gas which is present there or the electrodes we have chosen right so this was about the discovery of electrons yes so till now we discussed about yes the experiment which was done by jj thompson yes using the discharge tube yes cathode ray discharge tube and we discussed about the results that he obtained from his experiments so from all these results he was able to conclude that yes the particles present in your cathode ray is negatively charged and which he named it as electrons right now we are moving on to the next part that is charge to mass ratio of electron charge to mass ratio of electron jj thompson even tried to find out the charge to mass ratio of electrons so how he did this is so the experimental setup that he made to find out the charge to mass ratio was as you can see here yes the cathode rays as you know it emerges from the uh, cathode and moves towards the anode right so what he did is he placed a magnetic field and an electrical field perpendicular to each other yes you can see the magnetic field here and the electrical field here right yes they were placed perpendicular to each other and also perpendicular to the propagation of your cathode ray see cathode ray is moving in this direction yes and electrical field is present here and the uh, magnetic field is present in this direction so all three were placed in a form where they are proportional to each other right so what he observed was when only electrical field was applied your cathode rays starts deviating and it eventually reached a point a yes as we know that if there is no presence of electrical and magnetic field your cathode ray will move in a straight line so what he did is he just applied only electrical field so he was able to observe that your cathode rays deviated and reached a point a right now when only magnetic field is applied what happens your cathode rays starts deviating and finally it reaches a point c okay now when there is no electric and magnetic field is applied we know that your cathode ray will move in a straight line yes and it reach the point b there can be two cases if magnetic field and electric field is not applied it will reach b also if the quantity of magnetic field and electric field applied is equal then also your deviation will be there won't be any deviation directly you can see that it will reach the point b so this was the experimental setup that he did this was the experiment that he did and he was able to obtain these result so now based on the deviations that were created in here he was able to do the calculations to find out the charge to mass ratios so what does this deviations depend upon actually there are mainly three factors right the amount of deviation of particles in presence of electrical and magnetic field depends upon the first thing is magnitude of your negative charge right we know that cathode rays consist of negatively charged particles right so the first factor is magnitude of your negative charge see if greater the magnitude of charge greater will be your deflection right if the negative charge is more yes the value is more that means the deviation will also be more the second factor is mass of particle so if the 
mass is less or the lighter the mass the greater will be the deflection so the third factor is strength of electric or magnetic field so he was able to prove that deflection increases as the strength increases that means if the strength of your electric and a magnetic field is more that means your deflection or deviation will also be more so from all this results he was able to calculate the e by m ratio that is the charge E is the charge of your electron and M in the subscript it is E that means mass of the electron right. So E by ME ratio he was able to calculate it as this value 1.76 into 10 to the power 11 right. So this was the value that he calculated as charge by mass ratio of electron. Now we are moving on to the next part where we are going to find the charge of your electron okay we are going to find out the charge of the electron so yes R. A. Millikan devised a method called oil drop experiment to determine the charge on the electrons so to find out the charge on the electrons R. A. Millikan was the one who did the experiment that is his oil drop experiment from which he was able to calculate the charge of electron as 1.6022 into 10 to the power 19 coulomb. So this was the charge of the electron. Now how can you find the mass of the electron? See, from here you were able to calculate the charge to mass ratio. Yes, our JJ Thompson calculated the charge to mass ratio and R. A. Millikan even calculated the charge of electron. Right, so how can you find the mass of your electron yes so you have to divide your charge of the electron by the charge to mass ratio of your electron see if i am dividing e divided by e by me what it gives it gives me my me right that is mass of my electron right yes so what did he do 1.6022 into 10 to the power 19 that is the charge of the electron divided by yes this is the e by me value that was calculated divided it and yes this will be the mass of your electron 9.1094 into 10 to the power minus 31 kilogram clear so charge to mass ratio which was calculated by jj thompson was used here and r a millikan calculated the charge of electron from which we were able to calculate the mass of our electron. So yes, this is about the discovery of your electron, right? Now we are moving on to the next subatomic particles that is proton. So now we are going to see how proton was discovered, right? See now JJ Thompson was able to discover the electrons, right? Yes, he proved the existence of electrons inside the atom. Now, what Goldstein was trying to do is, he thought that if there are negatively charged particles present inside the atom, there must be positively charged particles also present somewhere. So that your atom will be electrically neutral. Atom has to be electrically neutral. So if there is negatively charged particles, there must be positively charged particles also present, right? So Goldstein started experimenting on this, right? So Goldstein experimentally proved the presence of positively charged particles. So what he did is, he took the same electrical discharge tube and he made little modifications in there. What he did was, in the case of J.J. Thompson's experiment, there was perforated anode, right? So in the case of uh, discovery of protons, what Goldstein did is, he took perforated cathode, okay? And when he... Uh, as we know that there will be a gas present inside and under high voltage, what he was able to observe, yes, there are some particles which started moving from anode towards the cathode. Yes, how he was able to prove it? He took the perforated cathode. So what happens? The particles move through this gap and once it reaches here, even in this case, yes, a fluorescent material will be present behind your cathode so that once the particles come and touches here, a red glow could be seen. Right. So he was able to prove that using his experiment uh, with a modified cathode ray discharge tube that a set of particles is moving from anode to cathode. Right. Yes. Electrical discharge carried out in the modified cathode ray discharge tube led to the discovery of particles carrying positive charge known as canal rays. Right. So as I said, the particles are moving from your anode to cathode. So you can name it as anode rays or else you can also name it as canal rays, right? Yes. Now the characteristics of anode rays or your canal rays, like we discussed in the case of your cathode rays, we'll be discussing now the 
characteristics or the results that he obtained from his experiment, right? So, even your anode rays travel in a straight line and canal rays are positively charged particles, right? Yes, as they are moving from anode to the cathode, right? They are positively charged particles and they are deflected by electric and magnetic field similar to that of a positively charged particle. So, how a positively charged particle would behave in the presence of electric and magnetic field the same way the particles present in your anode rays were behaving, right? So, he was able to conclude that yes, the particles present in your anode rays or canal rays are positively charged, yes? Now, the properties of anode rays depend on the nature of gas and material of the electrodes. So now in the case of your anode rays, yes, it depends. So now the properties of the particles present in your anode rays will depend upon the nature of the gas and material of the electrodes. So if you change the gases which is present inside your discharge tube, the properties will also change, right? So in the case of cathode rays, yes, the properties of cathode rays will not change with and it does not depend upon the nature of the gas and material of electrodes. But in the case of your anode rays, it, it does depend. Clear? Yes. So, this is about the discovery of proton. Clear? So, now we are moving on to the last subatomic particle that is neutron. So, we are going to discuss the discovery of neutron. So, the scientist who discovered neutron was James Chadwick. So, it is very important that you remember the names of the three scientists that is who discovered electron, who discovered proton and who discovered neutron. Clear? Yes. So, in the year 1932, neutrons were discovered by James Chadwick by bombarding a thin sheet of beryllium by alpha particles. So, what was his experimental setup? He took a thin sheet of beryllium and he bombarded it with alpha particles. So, there is a source you can see here which emits alpha radiations. So, these alpha particles will move and hit on the beryllium, thin sheet of beryllium that is taken. So, radiations were obtained from here. So, what was the behavior of these radiations? These radiations were highly penetrating in nature and the radiations were unaffected by electric and magnetic fields and indicates that they are electrically neutral. So, when we discussed about the properties of your um, electrons and protons, we were able to see that they deviated in the presence of electric and magnetic field. Now, let's see, in the case of neutrons, they are unaffected by electric and magnetic field. So, what does that indicate? Yes, they do not have charge. They are electrically neutral particles, right? Hence, the name neutrons. Yes. Now, neutrons are neutral particles having mass which is slightly greater than that of proton. It's almost equal to the mass of proton, but it is very, very slightly greater than proton. So, this is about the discovery of neutron. Yes, the alpha particles were bombarded onto a thin sheet of beryllium where you got the radiations which were having these properties. So, I hope you are clear with the discovery of your proton, neutron and electron. So, let us summarize the whole thing with the help of this table that I have shown here. So, the discovery of your electron was done by J.J. Thompson in the year 1869. As you can see, the nature of charge is negative, right? Electrons are negatively charged particles which are having a charge of minus 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb and relative charges minus 1 with a mass of 9.1 into 10 to the power minus 31 kg, right? Now, moving on to our proton. It was discovered by Goldstein. Yes, the proton was actually that there is positively charged particles present inside the atom was discovered by Goldstein, but the name protons were given by the scientist Rutherford. Clear? So, E. Goldstein in 1886 discovered your positively charged particles. Yes, the nature of the charge is positive. You know that protons are positively charged, which are having a charge exactly same of that of electrons, but it is positive, right? 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb. So, relatively, you can write it as plus 1, right? And the mass of it is 1.672 into 10 to the power minus 27 kilogram. So, yes, these values of charges and masses are very important for your numericals. Yes, clear. Now, comes to the discovery of neutron, which was discovered by James Chadwick in the year 1932. Yes, you know that it is electrically neutral particles. So, the charge will be neutral 
and the absolute charge will be zero and relative charge will be also zero and the mass is slightly greater than proton. You can see it is 1.672 here and it is 1.674 into 10 to the power minus 27 kg. Right. So I hope you are clear with all the three that is discovery of protons, neutrons and your electrons. So you can represent your electron as small letter E, protons as small letter P and neutrons as small letter N. So I hope you are clear with the topics that we have discussed in this session. Yes. So in next session, we will be discussing about atomic models. Yes. The Thomson model of atom and we'll be discussing on the Rutherford's alpha scattering experiment, which led to the Rutherford's atomic model. Yes, so we will be discussing on these. So I hope the class is clear for you. Thank you.